without any warning, a colossal fireball rockets down from space like a speeding bullet. Upon impact, apocalyptic destruction will ensue. The thing that's so disturbing about it is that we really don't know where almost any of the comets are. The great majority of them swoop in from an incredibly large distance, so hundreds of times further out than Pluto, unpredictably. And we don't even notice them, don't even discover them until they start getting heated up by the sun, so they really start shining and glowing. By that time, it only has a few months before it's going to cross through at very high speed through the inner part of the solar system. And that is really too late to do anything about it. In that case, we're talking about something that's five or six miles across. You're just dumping such an incredible amount of energy into one place at one time. It tends to light everything on fire, everything within hundreds of miles. And then that just creates mass firestorms. It's filling the atmosphere with smoke. Of course, if there are any cities, they're incredibly flammable. I mean, the amount of soot just completely blocks all the light. And it's not just you that can't see anything, it's the plants, photosynthesis. It can all be shut down as a byproduct of this impact. As destructive as an impact on land would be, a large comet or asteroid hitting open water would create even more havoc. You have dumped all of that energy of thousands of hydrogen bombs into the ocean. In a matter of seconds, you're vaporizing cubic miles of ocean. What is the water going to do after it's all blasted out in a spray of steam? All the other ocean water is going to flow right in as fast as it can and set up a tsunami like you cannot imagine. I'm talking about a wall of water that when it ramps up the shore could be hundreds, 500, 1,000 feet high and nothing's going to stop it. It will just keep on rolling in and obliterating everything for 50 or 100 miles. Then you would have all this debris fall back on the planet Earth. It'd be like a Christmas tree, seeing all these ornaments being thrown out in all directions. And then you would see firestorms, enormous areas of the planet Earth burning, releasing even more soot and ash in the air, blanketing out sunlight, temperatures would then plunge, and life itself would be perhaps extinguished. Once scientists had said it could never happen, now many were shocked. Some talked about the end of the world. If something sneaks up on us, then there's very little we can do. In fact, today, the most likely situation is zero warning. The next impact of a mile-sized object will probably happen without any prior discovery of it at all. The first thing you will know is when you feel the ground shake and see the plume of fire coming up over the horizon. Impacts today are a risk. They're a hazard. They're something we need to protect ourselves against. If we don't learn how to protect ourselves against impacts, then on the long term, we are likely to be wiped out by impacts. If it happened to the dinosaurs, it could happen to us. For the 10% of the big ones that have been discovered, there is no danger. But I can tell you nothing about the 90% that we have not yet discovered. So, yes, we understand the general nature of the risk, but we have not yet taken any real concrete efforts to protect ourselves or even to look and see if there's anything headed our way. Gene every day, almost to the point where it would make your head spin. In order to slow down that pace, it's important to explain what's happening one event at a time. Similar to placing the pieces of a puzzle into one uniform picture that can be easily recognized and identified. One of the pieces of the puzzle that has stirred a great deal of attention has to do with the intensity of seismic and volcanic activity in the Northern Hemisphere, along the Cascadia subduction zone and the Aleutian Island chain in Alaska. Most recently, seismic alerts have centered around the Yellowstone supervolcano, 
where a swarm of earthquakes reached nearly 900 in just two weeks. This is the highest number of earthquakes in the past five years for this short of a time frame. The last volcanic eruption within the caldera was 70,000 years ago, so it is well overdue for another outburst. A swarm of some 100 earthquakes hit Switzerland on July 1st with a 4.2 quake that was felt over much of Switzerland. Following the earthquake, some people reported noises and booms after the shaking that lasted between 2 and 10 seconds. One of the biggest volcanic news stories of this year concerns the vigorous and surprising eruption of the Bogoslav volcano in the Aleutian Islands. The volcano produced a large explosive eruption followed by a series of explosions on almost a daily basis. Some of these explosions have reached as high as 35,000 feet into the atmosphere. The highly explosive nature of these eruptions is likely rooted in the interaction between the new magma that is reaching the surface and the abundant seawater that it meets when it erupts. That water can quickly flash to steam and help fragment the magma into ash, thus adding to the explosivity of the eruption. This image shows how the continuous eruptions at Bogoslav have demolished much of its Aleutian Island home. Alaskan volcanoes have actually produced one or two eruptions per year since 1900. At least 20 catastrophic uh, caldera forming eruptions have occurred in the past 10,000 years. The awesome eruption of 1912 in the Katmai National Monument is the most recent. Alaska normally records 3,000 quakes monthly, but now seismologists have already reached the monthly average in just 10 days. This unusual sequence comprises, among others, three earthquakes larger than magnitude 6, seven larger than magnitude 5, and 50 larger than magnitude 4. The highest number of quakes recorded statewide to date came in 2014, when more than 40,000 were detected, an astonishing number. Mount St. Helens is one of those volcanoes that is unsettled in 2017, resulting in an earthquake swarm. The USGS detected over 120 earthquakes over the last few days, all occurring one to two miles beneath the volcano. Here's a look back at the shocking devastation left in the wake of the Mount St. Helens eruption on May 18th of 1980. We often associate volcanic eruptions with the earthquakes that precede the eruption. But what do we know about megaquakes? The largest earthquake ever recorded by seismic instruments on this planet was a magnitude 9.5 earthquake in Chile on May 22, 1960. That earthquake occurred on a fault that is almost 1,000 miles long and 150 miles wide, dipping into the earth at a shallow angle. So we know that megaquakes have occurred in our past and are likely to happen again. In fact, earthquakes of various intensity are capable of striking any location at any time. But history shows they occur in the same general patterns over time, principally in three large zones of the Earth. One of those zones is referred to as the Circumpacific Seismic Belt the world's greatest earthquake zone located along the rim of the Pacific Ocean, where 81% of the world's largest earthquakes occur. Another of those zones is referred to as the Alpide. It extends from Java to Sumatra, through the Himalayas, the Mediterranean, and then out into the Atlantic. 
This belt accounts for about 17% of the world's largest earthquakes, including some of the most destructive. The third prominent belt follows the submerged Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This would include the uh, New Madrid Fault Line. The last significant earthquake to occur, uh, to occur in this area was in 1811 and 1812, the most powerful earthquakes to hit the contiguous United States east of the Rocky Mountains in recorded history. In fact, the New Madrid earthquakes were so powerful that they were felt over nearly one million square miles. Not only did the quake reverse the flow of the Mississippi, but it damaged the sidewalks in Washington, D.C., and reportedly rang church bells in Boston. The New Madrid is the least understood seismic zone in the United States. It has often been said that another major earthquake in this zone represents a towering threat for which the central United States is almost entirely unprepared. I'm sure you've heard of the expression that if an earth-shattering catastrophe were to occur, that California would eventually fall off into the ocean. Well, that saying is a bit exaggerated, but California is moving horizontally north towards Alaska in a type of sliding motion. The dividing point is the San Andreas Fault System, which extends from the Salton Sea in the south to Cape Mendocina in the north. This 800 mile long fault is the boundary between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. The Pacific Plate is moving to the northwest with respect to the North American Plate at approximately 2 inches per year. Now, at that rate, it would take some 15 million years for Los Angeles and San Francisco to be next door neighbors. Unless, of course, a major pole shift were to occur, in which case the timeline could rapidly change. One important result of earthquakes that should be considered is that the earthquake itself does not kill people. It is the buildings and the contents therein that cause deaths in seismically active regions. There has been larger earthquakes that have sustained very little damage and smaller ones that have. It all depends on the manner, on the construction of the buildings, and the materials that are being used. Some buildings were never meant to withstand violent shaking. Much depends on two variables, geology and engineering. From place to place, uh, there are great differences in the geology at and below the ground surface. Different kinds of geology will do different things in earthquakes. For example, shaking at a site with soft sediments can last three times as long as shaking at a stable bedrock site, such as one composed of granite. Local soil conditions also play a role, as certain soils greatly amplify the shaking in an earthquake. The looser and thicker the soil is, the greater the energy movement will be. Fires are another major risk during earthquakes as gas lines may be damaged, which could dramatically change life in America overnight. Earthquakes are a powerful force that can change landscapes and lifestyles, but there is something even more distressing that earthquakes are capable of doing. Media sources have reported that the Chilean earthquake of 2010 and the Japanese quake of 2011 were so powerful that they caused a shift or tilt in the Earth's axis. The Earth, which spins like a top as it orbits the Sun, has its tilt permanently altered. If we evaluate the simple facts involved with these two earthquakes, then the probability of an axis tilt comes into focus. The earthquake that unleashed the devastating tsunami on March 11th of 2011 moved the entire main island of Japan by 8 feet. 
It also shifted the Earth on its axis by nearly four inches. Scientists who are familiar with the phenomena say that the axis being altered has led to the shortening of the day by 1.8 milliseconds. The law of physics implies that the axis of rotation doesn't change relative to other stars as a result of an earthquake. So if you were looking at the Earth from a distance, you would not notice a change in the Earth's orbit or rotation. However, because an earthquake moves the material around within the Earth itself, the position of the rotation axis changes. We call this the sloshing of the Earth's mantle in which the crust actually shifts. So if it appears that a shift of the Earth's axis took place in 2011, it is because we use points of reference on the Earth's surface to determine if this is, has occurred, where the probable cause is more accurately described as a shifting of everything on the Earth's surface. Here then is a look at the devastating effects of a mega earthquake and tsunami that hit the island of Japan on March 11th of 2011. The events that alter the dynamics of our planet are a part of the puzzle that when put into place 
help contribute to the overall picture of a planet in turmoil. But there are other pieces of the puzzle that are not so easy to identify or to put into place. One of those pieces has to do with the unexplained wave anomaly that is originating from Antarctica. This activity is quite apparent if you examine the recent morphed integrated microwave imagery as shown here. In April, the same type of activity and patterns were being produced from the same region. Due to the coordinates from which the anomaly seems to be originating, many believe that the waves could, to a certain extent, be linked to the Princess Elizabeth Station. The station is situated at the base of figures that resemble pyramids. You might have heard a while back about a report, although controversial, that former astronaut Buzz Aldrin, who had recently visited Antarctica, had tweeted a photo of a pyramid, explaining in his own words that evil is here. So what did he mean by his Twitter statement? His words were removed shortly after they were posted. It appears that yet another mystery seems to be originating from the South Pole that has yet to be explained. Take a look at this screencast from May 25th. If you look to the left of South America on this map, you will notice that the waves appear to be emanating from Antarctica and moving out into the Pacific Ocean. If you follow the pattern of strange anomalies here, then it certainly looks like something is happening that none of us can fully explain. But as I have indicated many times, the truth is out there, we just have to search for it, and one day, very soon, hopefully we will find it. If you follow these strange anomalies happening in our sky recently, then you will understand that our atmosphere is changing dynamically. What may have been the norm many years ago is no longer true today. A perfect example of the changes happening in our sky comes from Borneo, and it has to do with light pillars. These anomalous pillars, which appeared over Borneo on June 22nd, are extremely rare. They are normally found in one location, the polar region where light reflects off the mirror-like surfaces of ice crystals. Borneo benefits from year-round temperatures averaging 32 degrees Celsius or roughly 90 degrees Fahrenheit with a relative humidity of around 80 percent for much of the year. So how is it possible for ice crystals to form here even at higher altitudes? It is absolutely strange, but certainly makes for a great conversation. One more thing I uh, want to mention because it has gotten a lot of attention over on our Facebook page. We recently received an image from one of our sky watchers who had this photo from February 26th and he wanted to finally share it with our followers. It's a fairly remarkable capture of a planetary body that was briefly seen in the southeastern sky on that particular night. Now, as you may be aware, on that date, both Venus and Mars were located in the west-northwestern sky well above the horizon. Both were very visible, especially Venus, uh, which was resembling the star of Bethlehem with its uh, extreme luminosity. Many of you commented how peculiar and strange Venus was looking before it transitioned to becoming the morning star sometime in March. There are a lot of viewers second-guessing about this photo, but it seems that no one can fully explain uh, what this is. So I thought I would just get this out to you. You can go over to our Facebook page and follow the comments on this, as it really has garnered a lot of attention, as do all mysteries that are difficult to explain. So my friends, keep yourself informed on everything that is going on these days. Don't just rely on what the mainstream media or others may tell you. Investigate for yourself. That is the surest way to uh, get the information that you will need going forward. In the meantime, stay safe, 
Be aware of your surroundings and keep looking to the sky.